have a confidence that the amount of money left behind uh, is a- adequate to take care of the remedy. This is MCV Cast. I'm Aaron Murphy, Executive Director of Montana Conservation Voters. And that was John Sesso of Butte, the Superfund coordinator who has reason to be hopeful this week. We'll hear more from John in a moment. Here, as always, MCV's Deputy Director Whitney Tani and Political Director Jake Brown. Let's get right to it. Jake, two high-profile debates and two high-profile races this week. What's the takeaway? That's right, Murph. On uh, Wednesday night, the two candidates running to replace Greg Gianforte in the U.S. House met each other for their first debate, hosted by Montana PBS. MCV's endorsed candidate Kathleen Williams squared off against failed 2018 U.S. Senate candidate Matt Rosendale. And one of the questions focused on climate change, extreme wildfires, and destructive storms. Rosendale quickly focused on the recent catastrophic wildfires, conveniently pointing his finger to, well, not at the very real science causing them. We have so many thousands of acres of federal forests that currently are located within the state that are having beetle damage and dead wood, and there are the radical environmentalists that are keeping us from harvesting that timber which means that it finally ends up dying, lying on the forest floor, and then just becomes fuel for future fires that burn completely out of control. That is a major problem, these radical environmentalists. Of course, as Matt Rosendale knows, that is just simply not true. Anyone who pays even a little attention to their high school science class knows that forest management is a phony and dangerous excuse for the catastrophic climate breakdown which is wiping out entire communities. Here's Kathleen Williams. Yeah, well, I didn't hear my opponent say whether he thought climate change was occurring and whether there was any uh, human element to it. Um, You know, I've worked in resource management for for almost four decades, and and we cannot harvest our way out of fire uh, 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 risk pretty clear to us who the real conservationist is in this race, which is why Kathleen Williams was the very first candidate we endorsed this election cycle a full year ago. There was another big debate this past weekend in the race for Montana's Attorney General. Former House Speaker Austin Knudsen and MCV endorsed candidate Rafe Graybill. It's fair to say Rafe Graybill has Austin Knudsen on defense questioning his opponent's promise to defund the Montana Department of Justice. But one of the most memorable parts of that debate came down to controversy Austin Knutson stirred up in northeastern Montana. Austin, you have closed access to a veterans park in your hometown of Culbertson, and you're now suing that same group of veterans to block their access. In sworn court statements, those vets said that in 2016, when you were Speaker of the House, you verbally accosted them. Is that true, or are these vets liars? The response... This is where I think it's fair to say that Austin Knutson got knocked off balance. I'm certainly aware of it, and I'm certainly uh, aware of what my family's uh, issues are and what's going on in that case. The unfortunate truth of that case is uh, this is a problem that goes back for the last several landowners on, on our property. We've only owned it since 1991. My grandparents bought it in 1991 when I was 10 years old. It's also important to point out that public access to public lands came up in this debate, and so did funding for Habitat Montana. And Austin Knutson has a pretty awful record when it comes to public lands and conservation voters. By the way, the next U.S. Senate debate for Montana's candidates, endangered incumbent Steve Daines and Governor Steve Bullock will meet again on Monday, September 28th. Yeah, Jake, I looked up Austin Knutson's uh, lifetime score for MCV, and he scored only 4% when he was lawmaker. Yeah. Speaking of Senator Daines, despite his fantasy of being called a conservationist, Steve Daines still refuses to co-sponsor John Tester's popular Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act. And Whitney Tani, now the stakes are getting higher. It's true. Although the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act finally got a hearing last week and a robust 75% of Montanans support it, Senator Daines apparently still has cold feet. The legislation would protect more than 79,000 acres of wildlife habitat in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, Mission Mountains, and Scapegoat Wilderness, and create two new recreational areas for snowmobiling and mountain biking. But have faith, Montanans are not backing down and continuing to pressure Senator Daines to support the bill. 
In fact, this week, MCB endorsed Missoula County Commissioner Juanita Vero led a letter of support from the county about the importance of the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act. And if you thought Senator Daines' week got any better on conservation, you're wrong. Remember the TV ad we mentioned last episode that had Senator Daines taking full credit for John Tester's Yellowstone Gateway Protection Act? We went to Senator Daines. We talked to him about it. Senator Daines did what was right. Well, former members of the coalition that got that bill done in partnership with Senator Tester are biting back. In a scathing op-ed that is running in newspapers statewide, they wrote, For the benefit of his re-election, our junior senator falsely claims he passed a bill to prevent mining next to Yellowstone National Park. The group of conservation and business leaders continued, Dane sat silently rather than stand up for his constituents when called upon to protect Yellowstone's gateway, and now he wants to take credit. Don't be fooled. When Montanans asked for this bill, Senator Daines didn't deliver. Tough but true words for Montanans, Senator Daines. Checkmate. The Montana Supreme Court has finally weighed in on the petition by Secretary of State Corey Stapleton to keep Green Party candidates in Montana on the November ballot. As a reminder to our listeners, the Republican Party spent $100,000 trying to place fake Green Party candidates on the ballot in an attempt to siphon votes away from Democratic candidates, and they got caught. Fortunately, the Supreme Court agreed with every other judge who has heard this controversial case. They ruled that Stapleton should have never accepted the petition to place the Green Party on the ballot because the Green Party was never actually behind the petition. Hopefully, this is the last we'll hear about the GOP's attempt to place the Green Party on the ballot this election, but I have a suspicion that we're going to see something like this again in future elections. In other Supreme Court-related news, the court also found that the Public Service Commission and Northwestern Energy were using unlawful methodologies that would show new potential solar projects as uneconomical. The court essentially ruled that both the PSC and Northwestern were unlawfully biased against new solar projects. The plaintiff in the case, Montana Sun, will now be able to begin construction on the state's second biggest solar farm. It will provide enough energy to power over 14,000 homes, priced around $40 per megawatt, which is much cheaper than energy produced by utility dams or by coal strip. Safe to say, this decision is a big win for the solar industry. In court, lawyers for Northwestern Energy said that this ruling could result in, quote, a land rush for new qualifying solar projects. Well, we at MCV certainly hope so. Switching gears, we want to thank everyone who signed on to our Education Fund's supportive comments for the Big Snowy Mountains project being considered for purchase by the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Over 180 supporters signed on to our letter in less than a week, showing the excitement for the nearly 6,000-acre wildlife habitat addition near Judith Gap. If the purchase does in fact move forward, the money will come from Habitat Montana, our state's premier conservation program. This also means it will have to be approved by the Montana Land Board, as if you needed a reminder to vote November 3rd. We've linked our letter in the show notes if you'd like to learn more. We look forward to continuing to support this project as it moves forward. $150 million. That's how much is coming to Montana to help clean up Butte Hill after decades of negotiations between the Atlantic Richfield Company, or ARCO, the Environmental Protection Agency, the state of Montana, and Silverbow County. A federal judge this month approved the long-awaited agreement called a consent decree. And this week's guest has been in the driver's seat. Our guest this week is John Sesso, a familiar name to many Montanans. Until recently, John represented Butte in the Montana legislature for eight years in the Montana House, then in the Montana Senate, where he served as minority leader. As almost everyone in Butte knows, John Sesso wears two hats. He was also the director of Silver Bow County's planning department and has been involved with the Superfund cleanup in the mining city for decades. Now John's title is Superfund Coordinator, and that means he is very familiar with the challenges ahead for the city of Butte and its cleanup. And with the consent decree that was made public earlier this year, John Sesso, we are excited to talk with you about what's happening in the mining city. Welcome to MCV Cast. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Aaron. Oh, gosh, of course. Uh, So the approval of the consent decree between Atlantic Richfield, the EPA, and the state of Montana and Butte, Silverbow County was decades in the making. And for listeners who haven't been following the the ins and outs like you have, why is it so momentous? Well, the the cleanup 
project uh, is very important because, you know, Butte has been the center of the world, really, in terms of copper mining and uh, the mining industry uh, and also the labor industry, for that matter, as it related to the to the miners. And uh, fr- from that economic impact came an environmental impact uh, that was very, very serious. And it really talks to two issues, Aaron. One is public health, human health, and the exposure of humans to heavy metals. And uh, secondly, uh, the collection of, of those heavy metals in stormwater that uh, come uh, rolling down the hill during storms and then find its way into surface water, Silver Bowl Creek, at the bottom of the hill. So those were the two issues that had to be addressed after 100 years of, of, of neglect, really. You know, most of the activity that occurred in Butte was done under either uh, the law that was in place at the time or no law, uh, you know, for, for the longest time. And so what the miners were doing wasn't breaking any law. But, uh, of course, as we all know, Superfund uh, that was uh, enacted in 1980 uh, allowed for retroactive uh, relief in the sense that uh, even though you may have been polluting the earth uh, under the law uh, and legally uh, prior to that time, uh, this this Superfund law allowed uh, the government and the regulators to go back and ask polluters to clean up uh, hazardous waste sites from the past, and this retroactivity was a was a big deal, uh, and the only law in our country that allows you to go back, even though the polluter was operating under the law uh, at the time of the pollution. So in Butte, that meant meant a lot of mining waste, a lot of mining waste that had to be addressed, uh, a lot of pollution that was really just amongst our neighborhoods and our citizens for the longest time. So it, it was a real critical piece to the health of our citizens and um, also to environmental protection and the protection of natural resources, particularly water quality uh, in Silver Bowl Creek and then by extension, uh, the Upper Clark Fork River. I'm, I'm wondering, John, if you can paint a picture of, of what exactly the problem is. So mining has been part of Butte since, well, the 19th century. And uh, I don't think a lot of folks know how exactly all of those decades of of pulling minerals out of the grounds results in uh, groundwater and creek water that is um, unfit for anything, really. How does that happen? Can you walk us through exactly what the problem has been? It's, it's a little bit complicated, but the easiest way to explain the surface water and the exposure to humans issue is that the miners, starting in the late uh, 1800s and, and into the 1900s, uh, and prior to 1955, were digging underground and then brought the tailings to the surface, extracted uh, the copper. What was left behind was the dredge, you know, the, the dregs uh, of, of that activity. And so millions of, of cubic yards of tailings taken out of the ground were just strewn about on the Butte Hill uh, and, and in the uh, Silver Bow Creek Corridor. And then humans' activity, uh, either using those tailings to build streets uh, or build railroad tracks or, you know, basically uh, use it as ballast and as fill, distributed these uh, mine tailings that contain heavy metals. Uh, And really, the entire uh, periodic table uh, is in the ground, but primarily copper, uh, zinc, silver, aluminum, Cadmium; those are the, the the ones we've been been trying to address. So these heavy metals are just everywhere, and uh, the job of the Superfund project has been to remove, you know, a couple, two, three million cubic yards of it from the neighborhoods uh, that people live in, and then in the expansive areas on the hill to cap those tailings in place because that was the most practical and effective way to address the problem and then maintain these caps uh, in the forever to to make sure that when it rains, that the mine tailings are no longer exposed to mine waste and therefore no longer able to collect uh, heavy metals 
and draining them into our surface waters. Now the groundwater piece is a little more complicated. It has a lot to do with the Berkeley pit as it relates to open pit mining that started in 1955 here in town. In this case, when the Anaconda Company uh, sold to Arco and then Arco took over uh, the a company in 1976, by 83, they turned off the pumps. The way they kept the Berkeley pit dry was a massive collection of pumps at 3,900 feet below the surface in the Kelly mine, which pumped water out of the pit and uh, kept it dry for mining activity. When they turned those pumps off, then the, the Berkeley pit began to fill. And so all of the groundwater that used to be in the area where the pit was dug returned. And, and, and slowly but surely over these last uh, 37 years, the pit has filled up with this groundwater and some surface water coming off the, the East Ridge and the Continental Divide. And so then the, the disbursement of the groundwater is the issue. And so uh, over the many decades where this mining activity occurred, uh, it became clear that the groundwater was uh, get, getting polluted. And as the corridor, the Silver Bowl Creek corridor that used to run basically right through where the Yankee Doodle Tailings Ponds and the Berkeley Pit lies today, uh, that's where the original channel of Silver Bowl Creek went. And then, the, and then the third leg of the stool is the exposure of these mine tailings and the metals in the mine tailings, particularly lead. Uh, that has an adverse effect to uh, public health. Uh, and so we have had a what we call a residential metals abatement program where we go in and we remove sources of, of tailings, lead, arsenic, mercury, uh, from either the yards where people live or the attics uh, that had accumulated dust uh, over these many decades. So we have a very... Uh, what we think is a creative approach to uh, dealing with that problem as well. I would note that uh, in 1983, it was Earth Day, right? When the Atlantic Richfield Company, or as we call it, ARCO, shut off those pumps. So a bit of sad irony there. Um, question for you, this consent decree basically puts ARCO on the hook for $150 million in cleanup. I is that enough? Yes. Uh, the, the, the first thing that I'll, I'll mention too is, is that you know, Arco has really been working on this site since the early 90s. They've probably spent almost three times that amount already on the site. So Arco's already spent, you know, close to $400 million on the Priority Soil site. And the consent decree outlines nine or 10 projects that have to get done now. Those projects are probably going to cost closer in, in net present value terms, 60, 70, 80 million dollars, because the 150 million dollars is a is a net present value number, right? It's it's not the total cost. Half of the money is going to be spent in the next five years uh, fixing the last remedial projects that need to get done. And the other half of the money is is really put in trust uh, to take care of uh, the remedy in in perpetuity, right? And so you put sixty five million dollars in the bank today. Uh, it's going to spit out and be able to finance, you know, three four hundred million dollars of work over the next hundred years relative to the maintenance of this remedy. And so we have a confidence that the amount of money left behind is adequate to take care of the remedy. We have a higher confidence level now that the amount of money that ARCO has pledged under the financial assurance provisions of the consent decree will be adequate to take care of these projects that have to get built in the next five years. The consent decree also provides uh, additional work requirements in the sense that if we find something that we just didn't know uh, today, uh, but while we're implementing this project, the Atlantic Richfield Company is still on the hook 
for those additional work requirements. I think it's fair to say, John, that over the last few decades, both in your role as a day job, at, at now as uh, as the coordinator of this, and and prior as uh, state senator and state representative, that you were a leading voice on behalf of the people of of Butte and Silverbow County for a, a solution here. What has been your message as you've been working with all the other parties at the table? What what did you say? What did you insist on? As a, a an official. And, and, and as an advocate of the local community, we have used three tenets that have been important to us. Number one is that we had to do right by the resource. Uh, what we had to do to protect human health in the environment had to happen. There was, there was no quarter there. We, we had to get that done. But number two, we had to protect the pocketbook of the the citizens of this community so they would, they would never have to bear the cost of this cleanup and it was a little bit tricky because in 1991 uh, the the EPA named the local government and its citizenry by extension as a PRP as a potentially responsible party to this cleanup along with Atlantic Richfield Company. And then the third tenant was always make sure that our community got assets out of this cleanup. In other words, rather than just you know meeting the legal requirements of protecting human health and the environment, and then you know fencing off the, 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 the massive amounts of land and property that is affected, uh, we wanted to make sure there was a beneficial reuse, to all of the areas that got cleaned up or capped. And so it, it has been a management of, of liability and at the same time uh, protecting our citizens from uh, exposure to the costs and those liabilities. We've been in the room while these confidential negotiations were going on to resolve our differences and come up with a consent decree that Everybody now has agreed to, and now will be the blueprint for the remaining work and the long-term maintenance of that work in perpetuity. I'm glad you mentioned the blueprint because you indicated after hearing the news that Judge hadn't approved the decree, you said, we have a lot of work to do. So what is next in this blueprint and where do we start? Well, there are nine projects. And if you throw in the, the parrot tailings removal that's being conducted by the state of Montana, there are 10 significant projects that will be built in these next five years. And they include the, the removal of, you know, almost 700, 800,000 cubic yards of tailings, number one, uh, and to build uh, a new and expand the stormwater capture and treatment system that has been in place. But, you know, the science tells us there's, there's several things we can do, essentially build four more uh, uh, co collection ponds so that we can drop these metals out before the stormwater reaches the creek. We got to get back on the hill and, and redo uh, a number of caps that weren't done as well as they should have been. And then there were large areas that never got done on the hill because there was no criteria for the stormwater piece, just the human health piece. And then we've, we've got to get the corridor that is Silver Bow Creek cleaned up uh, because uh, it still uh, reports heavy metals to Silver Bow Creek. So these nine work plans are outlined in the consent decree, uh, uh, along with uh, how we're going to measure performance on how well uh, that work is, is performing. And uh, all that needs to occur uh, over this next decade. John Sesso, Superfund Coordinator in Butte, former state lawmaker and a key negotiator in the recently approved consent decree to get the upper hand on toxic cleanup in the mining city. John, thank you for your work and thanks for being on MCV Guest. Glad to be here. Thanks for, for inviting me on the show. This is where we remind listeners that the views of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of Montana conservation voters, its staff, or its board of directors. That said, a big congratulations to John Sesso and the countless others who worked so hard to make this happen. A quick update now on last week's guest, U.S. Senator Martin Heinrich of New Mexico. 
Senator Heinrich spoke with us about illegal BLM acting director William Perry Penley. Well, this week, Senator Heinrich had an opinion piece published in USA Today with choice words for Mr. Penley and his boss, Donald Trump. Mr. President, Senator Heinrich writes, you are no Theodore Roosevelt. There's a link to that piece in our show notes. We're less than one week away from our virtual gala on Thursday, October 1st, and hope our listeners will join us in this annual celebration. Our gala is our biggest fundraiser of the year, and we need your help to reach our $40,000 fundraising goal. Attendance is free, but we encourage a donation of $75 or more to support our work. Here's a little preview. Plus, have you seen our raffle prizes? Visit our website at mtvoters slash gala to learn more, and we hope to see you there. And with the election right around the corner, our MCV endorsement guides are on their way to mailboxes across the state. We've endorsed conservation champions and races up and down the ballot, and every one of those races will impact the future of Montana. Also featured is our support of ballot measures CI-118 and I-190, which will legalize recreational marijuana and provide more than $18 million for our public lands a year. You can learn more about those initiatives at a brand new website, publiclandsformontana.org. Other conservation organizations supporting this effort are our friends at the Montana Wilderness Association, the Montana Wildlife Federation, and the Trust for Public Land. Like many, we're stunned at MCV by the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was a giant for all of us, and as RBG lies in repose in the U.S. Supreme Court, then in state at the U.S. Capitol as the first woman to be given the honor, we hope in this moment you take action by checking your voter registration, making a plan to vote, organizing your family, your friends, and your community, and giving until it hurts. That could be giving financially or volunteering your time. This election, our democracy is at stake, and now is the time for energy and strength. And the U.S. Supreme Court is where we'll leave things today with a very important clip from the Montana television news program, Face the State. This clip of Senator Steve Daines is from February 28, 2016. That was shortly after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia and not long after President Obama nominated moderate Judge Merrick Garland to fill that vacancy. Back then, Senator Daines joined the effort to kill that nomination which President Trump filled a year later with Judge Neil Gorsuch. What you're about to hear is a far cry from what Senator Daines is telling voters today. Voters in this country have already started to pick the next president in Iowa, in South Carolina, in Nevada. And I don't think it's right to bring a nominee forward in an election year. And if you go back at uh, at history, you have to go back to 1888, Grover Cleveland, the last time there was ever a Supreme Court nominee that was filled in the vacancy that occurred during election year by divided government. You go back 80 years where you had members in the same party. You, we saw what Joe Biden said in 1992. He says the, the Senate should not move forward in election year for Supreme Court justice. 